Well, good evening, church. Welcome again to Studies in Leviticus. Skin diseases are on tap tonight, so I hope you're in the right class. I know, she's heard it before. We are in Genesis. Genesis 1, 2 to it's the hazard of me dragging her around all these churches. She gets to hear my jokes over and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, yeah. Let's have some prayer. Lord, we love you. Thanks for a beautiful day today. And uh, we thank you for it. We ask your blessings to be upon the evening as we enter into your word again to give us understanding. And I pray for your people today that they would uh, persevere through uh, these three or four uh, lessons, uh, they're, they're hard, Lord, I know it, but we need to get them and hear them. Uh, we may not understand them at, at first, but we'll keep coming back around and grabbing them and hopefully bringing some clarity to it. So, Father, we ask for your blessings to be upon us, your Holy Spirit, lead and guide us into all truth and um, especially lay these strong foundations that Genesis offers to us. And we thank you for it. We pray, Father, for those who couldn't be with us tonight or watching online, um, and uh, for those who um, are home, who physically just can't get here tonight. We pray for healing, uh, for wholeness, for wellness, uh, and we just thank you for what you're going to do in and through that as well. We just pray all these things in Christ's name, and all God's people said with me, please. Amen. Thank you. So last uh, week, we talked about Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Today I'm going to grab two and we'll see how far we get. But the main thing that I wanted you to understand last week was the gap theory. Theory. It's never been proven, never will be proven because it's not true. You cannot do a normal, literal reading through Genesis 1 and 1 and 2 and get the gap theory. You cannot do it. And all God's people said, please. There's a white space between those two verses and that's it. You cannot force billions of years and a whole nother planet and another complete flood and a fossil stratum in that space that doesn't work all that was was uh, a religious system no matter what you were part of who was trying to figure out how to get science which was supposedly true, interjected into the scriptures. That's all that was. It was like, well, science, we all know it today. Believe the science. Well, we know. Don't believe the science because a lot of the time it's not even right. It's a, it's a guess. It's an estimation. I'm not saying that all science is wrong. Empirical um, data, all that true science is worthy of respect. Cosmological science is not because it is not science. It's philosophy. Do you know? Do you understand that? Cosmological science is not science. It's philosophy. It's trying to figure out how the world was created, trying to use some sort of scientific methodology, but it won't work uh, because they're never going to get those answers because they've done an, a presupposition. And the presupposition is. There is no God. There is no God. The scriptures are errant. Uh, they only speak to what is sacred. But when it talks about science and history, uh, you know, we're not really sure if the Bible speaks truthfully about that. That is, that is the, the destruction of the authority of the scriptures. And it elevates science over the top of it. And, of course, that started uh, in the Enlightenment early on and then up through the 18th, 19th centuries with uh, Charles Darwin and everybody else that jumped on board with that. So is everybody clear about that, per se? So you can't call it a category or we're not supposed to add or take away from the scriptures. We are not supposed to add or take away from the scriptures in, in principle. That's what that's talking about. So we're adding something to the word of God that was never in there. Um, and that would be true, Tana. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. For me, I have a very high bibliology. I have a very high view of the scriptures. All right? I do. That's the ultimate truth for me. So when you bring in a doctrine that starts to undermine that, 
you're going to have a debate on your hands for me because I'm going after that. Because if you can destroy the authority of scriptures, so Jesus is your savior. Yeah, we believe that. Why? Who said? Well, the Bible, no, 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 no. You've destroyed the authority of the scriptures. I don't care now. You could have told me the Reader's Digest told me how to get saved. It would be no different. Does that make sense? When you destroy the authority of the scriptures, you destroy your truth foundation. So whatever you believe, if you cite it through the scriptures, I don't care anymore. It doesn't matter. It's gone. Does that make sense? It's just a religious book. It's a, it's a religious book written by man about God rather than high authority of scripture. It is God's word written to man about himself. That's high view. And all God's people said, please. That's, that's why we study. And that's why we study the way we do. All right? So review session three, Genesis one and two. Uh, this is the boring part, but you need to get it. Uh, now, conjunction plus noun plus verb. It's just language. Every language has rules. Every language has grammatical structures, syntax. It has all the things that govern it, all right? And the was as well, okay? So it follows that pattern of Hebrew. Um, so when somebody starts debating me about, uh, well, I choose to use the word and, and then I choose to use the word because, then I'm going to go, well, how do you get that out of the Hebrew language? I'm going to shove them right into the language system because you can't do those things with those words, all right? So we've got tohu and bohu. Uh, that is uh, void English adjectives, formless and void, or the key to describe it is what? It's, it's empty. That's what it is, okay? Hebrew nouns, uh, des uh, desert, I almost said dessert. Desert or wilderness, okay? Primary meaning, difficult to seize. So we're not really sure how to describe that. I just gave you some options as we look at that, all right? Just trying to see where I cited that. Uh, both terms signify, church, astonishment or amazement at its emptiness. It's sort of like if you've ever read the short book um, by, um, oh gosh, I just, Mark Twain, when he went over to Israel, he described it as what? There is nothing here. I mean, it is void empty and void you know that's all there is and so it's kind of that idea uh the greek lx lxx which is roman numeral for 70 which is the septuagint septuagint is the he greek translation of the hebrew old testament so for example if i'm in hebrew and i'm struggling with a particular word one of the resources that I'm going to go to is I'm going to go to the LXX and I'm going to see how did they translate that Hebrew word into Greek because it might give me a help on understanding what it means. Does that make sense? That's what I'm trying to do. So if you have another foreign language in your background, if you have Spanish or German or French, whatever it might be, Sometimes to understand a, a, an English word at a deeper level, sometimes it's good to go to another language because you can sometimes see how they look at that and then translate it differently. Uh, it's often very, very helpful. Tohu in the Greek then is often translated invisible or church unseen. Invisible or unseen. Bohu was translated it's, it's unformed, unformed. John Calvin translated it, confused chaos and emptiness. And of course, John Calvin is a reformer from Geneva, Switzerland, originally from France. So the initial state, all right? Now the earth was, okay? 
the word now is not in the Hebrew. It is a, uh, it's a, an inferred translation. The word is a, it's a vav, and it just simply means and, but it's used in this context temporally to say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, or now the earth was formless and void, and the spirit of God, the spirit of God hovered over the deep, all right? That's the fullness of the verses that we're looking at. So now the earth was a formless and void, and two, darkness, uh, historic modern interpretation, darkness is the, have you heard this before? The darkness is the absent of light, absence of light, but we now know that cosmic darkness is actually a substance. It is actually, church, dark energy. 60% of the universe is dark energy. And dark, dark matter, 27% of the universe is dark matter. So what am I talking about? Well, tonight, uh, before you go to bed, walk outside in your lawn and look up. And when you see all those stars, look around them, and you're going to see dark energy and dark matter. <laughs> it's black. And the interesting thing scientifically is, is they still don't know what that is. So if you talk about the, the amazing uh, properties of God as a creator, we haven't even scratched the surface of what's out there yet. We've been focusing on the stars and the planets and we have bypassed, you know, what's the percentage of that? 95% of what's up there, which we thought was nothing. And we're finding out it's something. And we're still trying to realize what that is. All right. I form the church, the light, and I create Darkness, I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And that's from Isaiah 45 and, uh, and 7. So I, I, once you realize that that black stuff is something, that verse makes a little more sense, doesn't it? So I created the light, but I also created, I created the darkness too. It's not just the absence of the light. It's not a passive. It's actually an act of creation. I created both of those things, which nowadays, as science catches up with the Bible, we realize that that darkness is actually a uh, substance. This is from Job 38, 18 to 20. Have you comprehended the vast expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places do you know the paths to their dwellings? Job is, in fact, in the poetic section, uh, so we don't want to make a doctrine out of it, but it certainly is interested, interesting as um, God speaks to Job in regards to this thing. It appears that darkness is at times interrupted as uh, church, a, a reaction or a s subsequence, but we can see that there was design even in darkness itself uh, we should uh, we also need to see this as a, a hebraic parallelism that's how poetry is often f put together um, and if you go back and look at that Isaiah passage he forms the light he creates the darkness he brings prosperity he creates disaster do you see how those light line up so there's a spiritual as an, or an analogical understanding of light and darkness as well. And we know that, don't we? We use it that way. We use it metaphorically. Hey, we're just praying that he comes into the light. Well, where's he at? Is there no light switch in there? Is there no light? That's not what we're talking about, is it? When we say that, it means what? He, yeah, I, I, hope he, I hope he gets some understanding in this, all right? And we do it conversely as well. Boy, they sure are in the dark, aren't they? And it means, converse, they don't know. They're sort of out of the loop. And so we use it colloquially. We use it 
metaphorically to speak of those types of things, and so does the Bible, all right, in that he, those uh, Hebraic parallelism. Third, uh, it was over the darkness, third part of the verse is what I'm after, I'm into. Uh, the darkness was over the surface of the deep. Surface in Hebrew means, church, it means the face of it, all right? The deep, some form of water collection, a, a primeval ocean. Uh, and we gave you the definition of that word primeval, all right? It's something before the full creative act of God. Something was there, all right? And it was, it was moving. We just don't know what it is. Why? Well, A, we don't need to know, but B, it no longer exists because things have changed. The, and the main event that happened that did that was A, creation, B, the flood. Both of those two are cataclysmic in in um, action. Uh, the Septuagint again, the ex LXX, the word is abusa, and we get our English word, it's transliterated, abyss. It's the bottomless place. This works if the earth was not a what? If it wasn't a solid. Note 2 Peter 3 and 5. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Interesting passage, isn't it? Yes. They, I don't know, Tana. She asked if there was, there is a lake. Is it, uh, it's subterranean. Center of the earth that they have found and I don't know, could be. Sure. Well, we know that when we get to Genesis, we know that when the flood happens, it says that the heavens, the firmament above let loose and the waters beneath came up. And so, yeah, I think it could be, Tana, I don't know. Um, yeah, you're so difficult tonight, Tana. My gosh. Thank you so much, though. Good. It could be. I don't know. I, I don't know, and it's interesting, interesting to think about, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. No. Uh, of the 92 natural elements, 25 are essential for life. Of these, there are six main elements that are fundamental building blocks of life. They are in order of least to most common sulfur, phosphorus, church, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and, and oxygen and hydrogen produce water. Yes, and carbon and oxygen, carbon dioxide or monoxide, both are essential, are they not? We breathe in oxygen, trees breathe in carbon. It's this, this relationship that we have with each other that keeps things going. And of course, we all know hydrogen, balloons, right? Is that right? <laughs> that's helium, Jeff. <laughs> oh, that's the hydrogen bomb. That's what I was thinking about. Okay. Anyway. Hey, I got to tell you this story. I had a, uh, she was, what was, uh, what was Mrs. Stupp? Was she second grade? I had a second grade teacher. Deb didn't like her. I loved her. Uh, she, didn't like she didn't like girls. She loved boys. That's why I loved her. She was sweet to me. Um, her husband, after I got out of school and got into ministry, she started attending our church, which was kind of weird because <laughs> I kept calling her Mrs. Stipp and I was afraid she was going to whack me and work on my grammar. But uh, 
her husband was this little guy, and um, he always looked like he was buffed up. Like this guy is like a weightlifter. And one day I commented, I said, man, what do you do, lift weights all day? And she goes, no, you tell him what you do. <laughs> she, I, she said, what? She goes, well, he doesn't want to stop work on Sunday mornings. He mows grass. So what he does is he puts his suit on over his coveralls. <laughs> so, so when he gets done with church, he takes off his suit and he goes right back to work. That's what he does. So he's got four pairs of clothes on underneath him. That's how he's so big. <laughs> but one day he came up and he grabbed a hold of my shirt. I don't know if I was teaching Genesis. And he goes, Dan, he says, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I, I think this is biblical. He said, uh, do you know how to stay alive until you're in your hundreds? I said, no. He goes, you have to eat bananas. I said, why? He says, because a high percentage of them are made out of water. And we're all made up of water. So if we eat bananas, and I thought, Ray, you're brilliant. I'm <laughs> going to go get some bananas tonight. So uh, I think he did live pretty old, but I don't know what it was, but. His potassium levels were still good, Doc. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, note this. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and Scripture had not yet disclosed when the creation of the waters took place. Consequently, you must learn from this that the creation of the waters preceded that of the earth, and a further proof that heavens and the earth were not the first thing created is that the heavens were created from fire, isn't that interesting? This is from Rashi, is this not? Yes, this is a middle-aged Jewish commentary that I found that I thought was quite interesting. Further proof that the heavens and earth were not for the first thing created, that the heavens were created from fire, uh, or, osh, ish, ash, and water, uh, which, from which it flows, that fire and water were in existence before the heavens. Therefore, you must admit that the text teaches nothing about the earlier or later sequence of the acts of creation. And it's interesting because that word for fire there is uh, closely related to the word for energy. Isn't that interesting? So I'm not in full agreement with what this guy says, but I found it very interesting when I was studying Jewish uh, Midrash. Four, uh, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. To hover means to, to be over or to move around a certain subject or object. It can mean to, interesting, to flutter over or to remain suspended over Deuteronomy 32 and 11 uh, for the Lord's portion is his people Jacob his allotted inheritance in a desert land he found him in a barren and howling waste he shielded him and cared for him he guarded him as the apple of his eye like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. So it's an example of how that word is used later on in the Pentateuch. It is significant that the transmission of energy comes in the form of, church, light waves, heat waves, sound waves, microwaves. Bill? Bill? Bill is asking, how do I explain the speed of light that takes billions of years to get here? That is a great question, and I hope you can answer that next week, Bill. <laughs> so, uh, I have an answer to it. I just have to think about it for a while. Can I, get, can I hold off to it? Because <laughs> I've been asked that before, and I, it's not here. So, uh, because light, we, light waves 
travel at the speed, uh, well, speed of light. So, and at the speed of light, oh, uh, how does that work mathematically, Bill? I can't remember. Right. Uh, it has to do with the movement out of that which was created because it's not a stationary movement. It has been moving out from the creative place. So um, I've got to keep thinking about that because it's a complex answer, Bill. Can I see if I have that? Because I think I might have addressed that, by the way. <laughs> I'll move on. Bill, great question. I just can't remember the answer. So Deb, you can comment on that later. So summation. In Conflict of Truth, F.H. Uh, Capron sees the five main forms of which the unknowable are redivisible. And the first one is this. This is what Bill's kind of talking about, though, in his question. So the first thing that we see is God creating time. So there is a time factor. He's creating it because God is what? He's outside of it. Time is a created uh, thing, all right? And uh, as Einstein proved with black holes and everything else, those things get bent. Uh, time gets bent. Uh, you know, you've got first, second, third, fourth dimension at least. I don't know how many dimensions they've, they're up to now. But uh, so time becomes very relative, no pun intended, all right? Second thing that was created then is space, so you've got a time-space continuum, all right? So that's part of Bill's answer too. So you've got an object that is moving at a certain speed in a certain context uh, that all has to be a part of that. Third, matter, you have the Earth, which is would be that planet, okay? So time, space, matter, all of these are coming into uh, existence they're 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 coming into place for energy uh, he uses this as the spirit of God moving hovering there's energy taking place there I think it has to do with the creative act of what's going on there as well and fifth is force you have that movement Overview of God's creative steps, the, they appear to move from the general to the specific or from the forms to the fullness. So as we begin entering into the creative act of God, you remember the first two verses are summation verses. They're telling you what happened. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was form and, uh, without form and void, void and formless and the spirit hovered over the earth uh, and there was darkness. I know that's all jumbled up, but that's where that's at. And then when we get into verse 3, now we're starting the pattern. God is going to say, now this is how that happened. Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, summation. When God starts to, the creative act, now we see the details on how he did that. Chapter 2 of Genesis is going to be even more narrowed. It's going to start out with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he's going to reverse it because it's the earth he's focusing on. And the whole of chapter 2 is specifically looking at day 6 and the creation of man and woman. So he keeps doing that. Does that all make sense, by the way, as you look at Genesis? So day 1, you've got the form. You have night and day, the fullness of it. You have lights of day and night, day 4, which would be Sun, moon, stars, the lights that govern the day and the night. Day two, you've got sea and sky, but the fulfillment of that is in day five because now you have what? You have creatures that are now fulfilling the oceans and you have birds that are now fulfilling the sky. And then day three, you've got fertile earth. And then on day six, you've got the creatures of the land and the vegetation and including humanity itself in day six. So once again, you see some parallelism there in day one, two, and three, connecting to day four, five, and six as we move through that. So his creative steps, number one, verse three, and God, this is very interesting, by the way, 
and God said, all right, speaking is the revelation of thought. I know that doesn't sound too deep, but it is. It's very deep, okay? Because it's not, it didn't say, and God thought. It says that God what? Said. He spoke something and it came into existence. So what was here, if we can think of it in, in an anthropological, uh, a, man, a mankind way, I think, and when that processes at the speed of light, it does what? But then it comes out. That's how I articulate it, all right? That's how I get it out uh, in revelatory action. So speaking is the revelation of thought, all right? And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but it is, it's going to also be on day six part of our discussion on what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Because guess who is the only creative act that actually has the capability of doing the same thing. Mankind. Other animals, they can speak to each other, but they cannot do the same revelatory thought that we do as humanity. We are uniquely created by God to be like him in this revelatory way. Question, what does this tell us about God? A, he is, church, He's omnipotent. He has the power to bring into existence something from nothing, and we call that in Latin, ex nihilo. Out of nothing, he brings forth, all right? He can, church, command, and the elements obey. He is a God of infinite, church, design. For example, a plant is not just a plant, Ground is not just a ground, not just ground. A plant is a horribly complex entity, isn't it? It just is. And so is dirt. I mean, if you think about it, all the minerals, ores, moisture, all the things that go into what we just walk on every day is just a, it's an amazing thing. Uh, note Psalm 33, 6 to 9. By the church, the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host, church, by the breath. We sang that song not too long ago, Miss Cindy. It's, yes, in our lungs. It, it's, God puts that in us. We'll see that in Genesis 2, by the way, because God creates the form, but it's not alive until he does what? He breathes into us and we become a living being. So by the word of the Lord, by the way, all caps, which means that word is what? It's not Lord. It's Yahweh. It's the covenant name of God. It's always personal. So yeah, it's connecting with the, it's connecting with the covenant. By the word of the covenant keeping God, the, wor- the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth, He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he did what, church? He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. It's a great psalm uh, that speaks to that. Verse, uh, point number two, verse three. He said, let there be light. And the, the literal word there is aura. Interesting, isn't it? We had this discussion. When did we have this discussion? This was a know your grid discussion. Remember we were talking, I'll save it because we'll get there. We were talking about Genesis chapter 2 at the end of the, of the end of the pericope where it said that they were both naked and were not ashamed. You remember we talked about that and we talked about what that might have been and from an Eastern Orthodox position, position it wasn't that they didn't have clothes but they were clothed with what? In fact, it says this in the scriptures. They were clothed with, not in Genesis, but another passage. They were clothed with light. 
Interesting to think about that, because I think about that with that word, all right? The word aura is an English translation of the Hebrew word. It can also mean fire. Remember Rashi was talking about that? That before anything was made, fire and water were those things, all right? Fire, energy, uh, aura. It's the same, same, same idea. All right, Isaiah 31 and 9 their stronghold will fall because of terror at the side of the battle. Standard, uh, their, their commanders will panic, declares the Lord, whose, keyword there, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. It means the presence of God. It's also interesting to note this, that the word for angels, the one grouping, we liked, talked about this, seraphim, they're what? Burning ones. Yeah, they're ones that are on fire. So it's, there's a lot of connective tissue in regards to that, which is quite interesting. The word can also translate, church, heat. Um, Isaiah 44 and 16, half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, ah, I am warm I see the fire. So that passage, once again, uh, is talking about that. Number two, verse three, let there be light, literally an aura. Uh, God said light and made, it, and made a judgment, and the judgment was what? It was good, or it was pleasing. For God who said, this is 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, he's talking about metaphorically now, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory uh, displayed in the face of Christ. Uh, this is not a moral statement of conduct, but descriptive summation of a particular action, it means it's qualitative. So if you have a piece of fruit and you slice into it, and you're going to say it's qualitative, it would be what? It is either or. It's either good or bad. So it's a qualitative uh, statement. It's not a moral statement. It's not that God created something and he went, wow, this is evil. Because that would be against his character, wouldn't it? Because God doesn't, cannot do that. So there has to be something else. So it's qualitative in nature. So it is, he looked at it and he said, this is, this is good work here. I think I, think I like this, All right? And he's gonna say that repetitively, by the way. So what did God do next? A, God separated the light from the darkness. Now remember, we don't know what that light is because what hasn't been created? Yeah, everything that was gonna light up our night sky that we're used to, that's on day four. So Three days prior, at the very beginning of thing, God is doing something, and we're not quite sure what that is, all right? Uh, that word aura, energy, whatever that is, God is separating that out from the dark, uh, from the dark energy, the dark matter that he has been creating. Q, what did this mean? A, progressive. It's a gradation from light to dark. For example, we cannot say there's a separation in our world between daylight and night, can we? We can't because it's always what? It's, it's blurring into one another. It's a progressive gradation, which means it just keeps getting darker or it's getting lighter. That's how that spherical works with a, a light source, all right? So it's progressive. It means a gradation from light to dark. Or it can mean positional. Uh, it can mean at certain times it was light and at certain other times it was dark. Uh, we're just not sure how that all works. Question, what was the light? It was not church, the sun, or the stars because they would not be created for another 
three days. If you need words or help me, I'll, I'll stop for you. So I don't want to go too fast. All right. So what, are, what was the light? Brilliant answer again. We don't know. We don't know what it was. Early rabbinic writings believed that it was the Shekinah glory of God, the glowing presence of God. And we have a comparative there with the transfiguration, don't we? When Peter, James, and John went up and Jesus was up there on, on the top with Moses and Elijah, and it says that his, his countenance changed and it was what? It was brighter than any refiner's soap. I mean, it was a brilliance. And once again, I go back to that, uh, that connective tissue of what were Adam and Eve like? How were they clothed? Could it have been not the very presence of God? I happen to more and more believe that. And I'll give you another illustration of why I believe that. When Moses went up on Sinai for 40 days, when he came back from being in the presence of God, he was what? He was glowing, so much so that he had to do what? He had to put a veil over him, all right? Second Corinthians says so that they wouldn't see the, the presence, the, the, the shining uh, of the, the effectual shining leave him. So there's, I don't know, my brain connects that stuff and the more and more I, it seems to support that in my, in my mind. What can we know about the light? A, it was... It was visible, right? It was able to be seen. Two, it was a light that it coexisted with the darkness, right? It was in the same sphere, if you would, of observation, if we were there to observe it. Third, it was a light in a, in a fixed position in relation to the darkness because it said God did what? He separated them. So that is a fixed position. It doesn't mean that they stayed that way. I can be in a fixed position and still do what? I can still move. The fixed position isn't external. The fixed position is internal. My fixed position is that which is relative to my own movement. So I can move like this, and I'm still in a fixed position, although I'm moving, because the relationship is not here. The relationship is here. All right? Uh, third, verse 5a, God called the light day, all right? And he called the darkness night. Question, what is involved in the action of calling? What does that mean? Um, Cross-referencing. I'm having trouble seeing that screen tonight for some reason. Maybe my eyes are just too tired. Uh, cross reference since 2 and 23, Adam keyword called the woman he called her Eve it means multiple words it means church ownership it means relationship uh, or simply a distinctive identification it's calling something uh, so in this one I like the latter description it's a distinctive identification I'm calling something this for what reason? So that later on it can be identified. All right? 4 verse 5b, and there was evening, darkness, and there was morning, light, the first day. So Jewish, the, the Jewish day does not begin at sunrise. The Jewish day begins Sun down. That's why Jesus had to get put in where? In the tomb because they couldn't have anybody hanging on a cross when it got dark, especially on the Shabbat. Does that make sense? So we got to get him down. That's why they went and broke the other two guys' legs. Let's get these guys down and off because uh, we don't want them hanging there after that. Uh, we'll talk about day. Um, at some point, it's going to be Yom. All right, Pat brought up the day-age theory. Well, could a day be billions and billions of years? Not according to the Hebrew. It means one 24-hour period. It means a day. And so once again, when you talk about a day-age theory, which means a day is millions and millions or billions and billions of years, my question is, 
Why do you have to make it mean that? You have to prove, because they have to prove something, and that's what? Well, they have to prove there's no God, but they have to prove an evolutionary theory that has to take millions and millions and billions of years for it to work out. Because if you ha take away the mathematical formula and you have a young earth with things that were created very quickly, then evolution doesn't work. Does that make sense? So once again, the day-age theory, instead of taking the normal definition of the word that every Jewish four-year-old understood, yom is the word day, and it means one 24-hour day. And then also, if you're debating this, if you go after the billion, billion years thing, and why do you need that much time? You need that much time. Do you see the backwards uh, movement they have to do? I believe this. So if I believe this, then I have to create the evidence to support that. Does that make sense? So this is what I believe. So now I have to create what's not there in order for that to work. Biblicist, we do the opposite, don't we? We look at what the scripture says and we say, this is what I believe. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. That on the first day, which is a 24-hour period of time, God created this. All right, I believe that. Does science support that? Who cares? <laughs> God said it. And my question, the follow-up then is this. Well, what type of God then, I'll, I'll say this because I have Christian brothers and sisters who believe this, so I'm not making light of it, but I am getting after the authority of Scripture again. So for brothers and sisters in Christ who believe in a day-age theory that believes a day is not 24 hours, but millions and millions and billions of years, my question to them is this. Well, then what type of God do you have where you believe he can't do something like that in 24 hours? Very good question. Guess what I never get? I never get an answer to that. So there's ways of asking questions to unravel people's assumptions on things, all right? Doesn't mean I have all the answers, but if I find something in scripture, I'm gonna start there first and then figure it out. And if I never figure it out, guess what I'm still gonna do? I'm still gonna believe it because I have a th high authority of scripture. So God doesn't owe me an explanation of anything. He just tells me what he did, all right? And so I, I hold forth to it. Day-age theory, a day is to be interpreted as an age of, this is key, evolutionary geology involving millions, if not billions of years. It's not a literal day. And the other terminology that makes this sound really good is theistic evolution, which means I believe that there is a, God, but that he took billions and billions and millions and millions of years to evolve that which is before us. So I will say, I agree with you on the God thing, but you cannot prove the evolve thing because you run into the same problems that the evolutionists do. The evidence doesn't support it, all right? It's cosmological philosophy. It's not science. The word day in Hebrew church is, it's Yom, Yom Kippur, day of atonement, all right? It doesn't mean millions and millions and billions of years of atonement, it means day, one 24 hour period. It is always a literal tw uh, 24 hour lunar, because you remember, how does the day begin? It begins at night, it's a, it's a moon system. We have a solar system. All right, we have a, we, our day begins when the sun comes up. Uh, we have a solar calendar, all right? 24-hour day when it is accompanied by a cardinal number. Steve, that was this I was trying to remember the other night in our class. I don't know if you remember it, but I was because I couldn't remember it, all right? When it's accompanied by a cardinal number, card, that's how I remembered that. I couldn't remember the second one. Cards, when you're playing cards, it has what on it? Numbers, that's how you remember the difference. A cardinal number, one, two, three, or an ordinal number. An ordinal number, which is what I couldn't remember, has 
first, second, third. So it's sequential in nature. It's the word that God chose to use in describing the first day. All right. Uh, notice the order again in verse 5 and B. What a, a celestial object do we use to measure days, times? Uh, ours, we measure it by what? Sun. We have a solar calendar, all right? The Gregorian calendar is a solar calendar. It's not the lunar. That's the Jewish holiday, all right? What celestial object do Jews use to measure the day and time, church? They use the moon. They use the lunar, all right? What's personally significant about the order of time as God designed it? God starts our day with what? With rest. Yeah. He starts our day with rest. Rest. Unless you're working the night shift. All right. Uh, but normally it's a day thing. Okay. So he starts it out. So when you go home and the sun sets, whatever time, and you're heading to bed, you're starting your day. I think that's beautiful, by the way. Don't you? That God... God wants us to rest. That's how we begin our day. Because at the end of the days, guess what we are promised? Rest. Uh, an eternal Shabbat. An eternal rest with God. Is that it? Holy smoke, how did I get through all that? You guys didn't ask many questions. Good. I think we're going to maybe, st we'll stop then. Yeah, I don't have another worksheet out, do I? Okay, good deal. So I have one question left that I got to flesh out for Bilya, and that is the, uh, how do I answer the b billions and billions of light years uh, where light travels? Um, and I'll look that up, Bill, because I cannot remember how to answer that sufficiently for you. So it's not that I don't have an answer. It's just that I can't remember it. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, any other questions on that? So are the two major things that are accompanied with an evolutionary mindset that are not that are, are against the scriptures are between one and two. What theory? The gap theory. It is jamming science between two verses that just aren't there. All right. The other thing that has to do with evolution is one we just looked at, and that has to do with a day is not twenty four hours, a day is a day is whatever you need it to be to make your theory work. So it's whatever this package is, that's where that's at. Both of those church, both of those have to do with the authority of Scripture. So what does God's word say? It does not say that there was a gap between one and two. What does it say about the day? It doesn't say it's millions of years. It said it was, one, it was a 24-hour period of time. Does that make sense? Those are authority of scripture issues. So I have brilliant, brilliant men who have PhDs in science, um, in research science, who are beloved followers of Jesus, and uh, they hold to a day-age theory, but they hold to a day-age theory because all of their education has been based on what? On evolution, all right? So they're still trying to figure out how to put what they've been learning since grade school uh, into scriptures that they know and love, but they can't figure out how to reconcile the two, and they never will because they're both what? They're not reconcilable. They don't work. It's not supposed to fit together. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. All right? Any other questions tonight that I can grab since we've stopped a bit early tonight? Because you all understand it, right? Yes. Yeah. Sure. You know, I, I think as a kid you go, you know, somewhere up there there's a big black sheet. God's on the other side of it, and he put the stars and the stuff in front of it. So it's just a backdrop. That's all it is. And we're finding out it's, oh, gosh, it's so much more than that. So 
That's why I love those scriptures because it says he created the light, but he also created the darkness. It's still part of his creative power. And it's the thing that we don't recognize when we look up in the sky. If we look up in the sky tonight, you're going to see how much greater God is because not only did he create all those twinkly things up there, but he created everything that surrounds it. All the black that we take for granted is his creative handiwork as well. It's amazing to think about that. Yes, Terry, please. Yeah, metaphorically, uh, the darkness is real. It's all around us. And there's probably a point to be made that the darkness at present is a lot greater than the light that is out there. However, the darkness also makes the light shine a whole lot brighter, doesn't it? The contrast is so much greater, and I think that's the point for us. If we're supposed to be the light of the world in darkness, those metaphors that God uses, I don't know if this helps you or not, but when you think about the creative conversation that we've had, and now you start seeing how Jesus uses light and darkness... And makes a complete difference on things. So, yeah, well done. Other thoughts? Yes, Chris. I think it's energy uh, because of that word aura. So that's where I'm piecing Moses' face with Jesus' transfiguration, which in, I think in 2 Corinthians 5, it talks about, um, you know, not being clo- unclothed, but being clothed with light. Uh, all that stuff kind of fits together because it's not sun, moon, it's not, Light bulbs. Yeah, it's a different type of light. Yeah, when if you think about this, God declares himself in a objective sense when he says, God is light, first John, and in him is no darkness. So God is the very essence of what that is, whatever that is. The Eastern Orthodox I'm sorry, Chris. It means he doesn't have, and that's a spiritual uh, example. He's saying, I don't have any evil in me, all right? So in that yeah, in that context, he, he is all the things that light is. Light is truth. Uh, light is pure. Light is, there's all kinds of things we can attribute to that one word. But that's what God is. He is this. He's not this. So when we talk about Eastern Orthodoxy, we talked about it in your grid class. The, the apophatic, uh, how do I describe God in a negative way? If I don't want to say that God is light, I say that God is not darkness. That's who he is. He's not that. I really don't. And that's it's appropriate because at the end of the day we go, yeah, but I don't know what light is. I don't know what that is. And the especially Eastern Orthodox Church would go, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you don't know what it is. Uh, Well, essence, the essence of God is who he is in his nature. It's what makes him up. The Eastern Orthodox also teach that God in his essence is, uh, his essence is only for him, but what flows out of him, his radiance, his Shekinah glory, they call that the energies, which is interesting. So they will call that the energies of God, which means it's still God, but it's not his essence. It's not part of his unique person. It's what flows out of him. Does that make sense? So that would be the Moses thing. It's like, what is going on with your face, man? <laughs> it's like, I don't know, but I've been in the presence of the Lord and I'm, I'm radiating with something 
that has affected me physically. And the same thing that happened with, on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, his, his clothes turned white as a refiner's soap. I mean, what, what is that? What was the Shekinah glory that showed up in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies where people couldn't go even in the place? What was that? I don't know. But it was something visible and it was something they, they saw and it was locative. Uh, it was in a specific location. Does that make sense as well? So there's all kinds of questions I have about that that I keep studying and my understanding keeps shifting and I, it's whittling down to where I'm getting a little bit more of it as I keep researching, but yeah. Yes. Moses and Elijah, yes. You know, I, th I, I think Chris's question uh, was, how did Peter especially know that that was Moses and Elijah up there with Jesus? I think the transfiguration was uh, Jesus' way of giving Peter, James, and John a little glimpse of heaven. And not only to see the radiance, but also to give them a, a deeper revelation of, of seeing things that they would not normally see. Because Peter calls them out by name. It's like, wait, these guys have been, A, the one's been dead a long time, the other one didn't die. And he went up in a chariot of seraphim, by the way. So, yeah, so I think that was a little taste of heaven. And I think that fits with our thread of what was that? It's like, I don't know. But it wasn't normal. It was supernatural. It was something maybe that God created at that beginning when he said, let there be light. I don't know. Doc, question? Or mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Four. Yes. Doc was talking about when we studied Daniel and the three young men that were thrown into the fire and a fourth person showed up and yet they could still see into that fire uh, and they weren't burned up. You know, was that part of it? I don't know, Doc, it could be too. I think that's, that could probably put in my file a little bit to figure that out, Kathy. Of course. Well, yeah, it gives us hope that we will recognize each other. But let me put this in a real practical matter because Deb and I have both, we haven't seen it, but we've heard it. <coughs> Excuse me. Where people who have such a deep, deep prayer life, for example. <coughs> Do you remember Maureen? <coughs> there was this gal, <coughs> she, her husband actually made her a prayer closet because she was just in prayer all the time. She wasn't a perfect person by any way, but boy, she had this prayer gift. And every Sunday after church, a group of our church family would go up to the hospital and we they would sing old hymns to people. They would go from room to room to room. <clears throat> and one time they poked their head, they always had to ask first, they poked her head into the room and there was a lady in bed and they said, can we come in and sing to you? And she looked and she said, no. And then she saw Maureen and she says, I would only want her because she has the presence of God. Isn't that amazing? So don't think that this is something eternal that's gonna happen. I think it's something that's attainable if you are in the presence of the Lord Cindy sent out that text to us as worship team about what it means to be in the f face of God, the presence of God. Yeah, seeing the face of God, I think that's a Moses thing, and I don't think that's a one-off. I think if we press into that, if we press into prayer and being in the presence of God in that way, um, who, who knows, God might. Uh, and, and this is the point. None of, none of the rest of them saw that. It was only her that saw that. Isn't that interesting? So maybe God gives the gift to people like Peter who get to see Elijah and Moses and Jesus in a transfigured state when no one else can see that, but other people can. So I don't know. It's something to strive for, isn't it? Wouldn't that be wonderful for people to see the presence of the Lord on us in such an amazing way? 
Yeah, so Miss Chris, whatever that or <coughs> that aura was, whatever that light was, A, it was created by God. And whether it's the energies as the Eastern Orthodox teach or whether it's something else, I, I don't know what it is. Um, because we don't see it again post day four. Does that make sense? We don't, we don't see that aura was out there somewhere. That's why I think a really good translation might be the energies of God. Because it's not light as in day four, sun, moon, stars. It's not that. So, great questions, aren't they? Wonderful to think about as well. Good. Let me pray for you. Father, we, we pray and thank you for a uh, good night and for the opportunity to discuss and wrestle with these things. And Father, I've been studying these things for 26 years and I still have questions and still wrestle with uh, ways to answer things appropriately. And yet, at the same time, I'm excited because I see glimpses of things like the radiance of Moses and, and um, the transfiguration. And I wonder uh, what Adam and Eve looked like. Did they have a, an aura of holiness because they were constantly in the presence of God? Uh, I think it makes sense because when they sinned, guess what? They saw that they were naked and they were ashamed. Something left them. And maybe that's the point. Maybe sin keeps us from having that aura that God wants us to have. So Lord, as we keep pressing in and understanding how you created wonderfully this world we live in, may we leave in awe of your uh, sovereignty and your power. Uh, may we not walk out into our world without looking at the simplest of things and realizing how complex they are and how wonderfully they are made. So, Father, we thank you for that, and uh, we pray that you'll continue to give us eyes and ears and hearts that truly do understand these things, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, please. Amen. Thank you, church. Appreciate it very much.